weird, right? <laughs> when things don't go the way you expect them to, when things seem to be kind of out of order. We all have a different response when things like this happen, but even now there's just no one standing on the stage. There's supposed to be someone standing on the stage. Pastor Jason is usually up on the stage by now. He let this other guy preach, and all of a sudden there's no one on the stage. What is happening right now? When things don't go the way we expect them to, oftentimes it creates chaos in our life and chaos in our world. And we all have different responses to that. Uh, You can think to yourself and wonder, and you would know better than me, would you be the first person to just get up, walk out, go run and get your kids because these people are weird and they just like to sit in silence? Would you be the last one sitting here, the last man standing, just patiently waiting for something to happen. Like I said, we all respond very differently when things are out of order, when there's chaos in our life. And unfortunately for myself, uh, if you saw on the slide, my name is Josh Roz. I'm the Well Youth Lead here at Wellspring. And uh, if anyone of you knows me and knows my life right now, you know that there has been some chaos in my world very recently. Um, You'll see some pictures coming up on the screen behind me of what my house looked like the first of this year, of 2018. So when we came home, we went out to a friend's house New Year's Eve. We had dinner with them. We had a great time. We came home about 1030 at night. We're thinking, all right, you know, we'll get settled. We'll, you know, get our daughter to sleep. We'll get settled into our house and get ready for work tomorrow. Um, And then we opened the front door. (laughs) And um, it sounded like we left the bathroom faucet running when, as it turns out, a pipe had frozen and burst water all over our house. And the majority of these pictures are a little blurry, but you can kind of see the extent of the damage. And this is, this is our bedroom. This is the master bedroom of our house. And you can see the sheetrock laying down on our bed, which is where we thought we would be sleeping that night. Of course, that wasn't how it ended up, happen- ended up happening. So my family and I have now been displaced from our home for the over three months. Um, we're living with my in-laws. Um, which thankfully for us, our in-laws are actually pretty awesome. But as you can imagine, it still creates a little bit of tension. It's still not our home. It's still not our place. It's still someone else's house that we're living in with my wife and my child and, and us. And so if, even if you've never experienced something specific as a house flood or a house fire or an issue with a home or your belongings, most likely I can say with some degree of confidence that Everyone in this room has experienced some level of chaos along the way in their lifetime um, because life on earth is not easy. Life can be really, really hard. And oftentimes we end up in situations that we didn't see coming, that throws us completely out of whack. And I would like to say that as the preacher man for the morning, that I had the perfect response And I got down on my knees and prayed to the Lord and said, God, thank you for this opportunity to get closer to you. Um, But in reality, that's not what happened. Uh, My wife can attest that the words that I said that first came out of my mouth are not words that I would say into this microphone right now because Pastor Jason would never give me a mic again. They were not words that you would have heard coming out of Jesus' mouth. Um, But over time, Jesus was there for us. Uh, in our in our chaos and continues to be as our life is still in chaos as we continue to fight with our insurance company as we continue to work with contractors as we continue to to go through this experience and it's my hope that this morning what you're going to hear as we talk through um, a passage of Luke chapter 4 is that Jesus has not only the ability but the desire to be there for you and to support you especially and even when life is at its most chaotic moments. Um, So I just want to take a moment quickly to pray for us this morning. So if you would join me in praying before we get started. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you so much for Wellspring Church and uh, for Pastor Jason and everything that you've done through this church to bless me specifically and to bless so many others, those in this room and outside of this room. Um, Lord, it's my prayer this morning that you would use me in a way to speak that would allow us to leave here, every single person in this room, including myself, different than when we came in. That the people that we came in as, that they would be changed, that they would be different, that you would change our hearts, that you would change our minds, 
that you would rejuvenate our souls through hearing from the Bible this morning. Lord, we know that you are real. We know that you are amazing. And we pray that you would be here for us this morning. And as we deal with chaos now and prepare for future chaos, I pray, God, that you would enable us to understand that you are there with us at all times. I pray these things in your name. Amen. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 4, verse 31. Uh, The the verses will be behind me on the screen. You can also follow along in the Wellspring app, any other Bible app, or a paperback Bible, which I find most people don't actually own anymore, but if you have one of those, you can use it. So this is Luke chapter 4, verse 31. Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. So let's take a second to set the stage as this is the beginning of the story we're going through, and we'll continue working through it as the morning goes on. So Capernaum is a city that is right on the water. It it would have been a port city from everything we understand um, through reading history and and reading the Bible and commentaries and things like that. So it would have been a town that had some hustle and bustle to it. There would have been a lot of people there who were engaging in trades, like, you know, whether it be making crafts or making, you know, carpentry or, or making certain foods. So when people would come into the port, they would have something to sell or trade or barter with, um, and this was a way of life for them. So six days a week, it was hustle and bustle, it was getting moving and earning a living to support their families. But there was one day where in the Jewish tradition, they did nothing, absolutely nothing, and that was what they referred to as their Sabbath. So now we're uh, we're in a bigger town, and bigger towns have bigger synagogues, which is where they are now. And what we need to understand is, because no one is working, what better do they have to do than to go to the synagogue to hear from the Bible, which would have been the Old Testament at this point, because the New Testament hadn't been written, because it's happening in real time for them, and, you know, hang out with some friends, hear from the Bible, see what's going on, learn something new. So most likely, the synagogue was packed. There was probably tons and tons of people there. Uh, more than would be on a regular work day when people had things to do and things going on. They didn't have enough fr- as much free time to spend the whole day um, there in the synagogue. It also says that, that Jesus' is teaching, quote, astonished them because of, not just because it sounded nice, not just because it was cool or he was a nice guy, but because his word possessed authority. And the significance of that is that most likely what they're implying here is that Jesus was not quoting another rabbi or another teacher. He was reading from the scripture and then just speaking and speaking from his own thoughts, his own interpretation. And that didn't happen. Other rabbis and other teachers would quote, you know, priest so-and-so said this, and this is what we're talking about this morning. Similarly to the way that I prepared for this morning, I met with Pastor Jason on several occasions. I consulted several commentaries. I met with and talked with other people to make sure that I was on the right track, to make sure that I had something of meaning and something of value to share with you this morning. If I came to you this morning and just read Luke chapter 4, 31 to 37, and then just talked about whatever came to mind next, it probably wouldn't have too much substance. You probably would leave thinking, yeah, I guess that was nice, but what does it really mean for me? But Jesus, being God himself, had the ability to read the scriptures and just speak. Just speak straight off of his head whatever came to mind because, being God himself, he would be right. And he would be, his word would be perfect. And they understood that and they saw that his word possessed authority. And I want you to hold on to that word authority in the back of your mind because it's something that's mentioned two times here in this six verses. And so it's obviously something that we're going to be focusing in on this morning, and we'll get to that a little bit more later. For the moment, I want to, if you guys either listened to Pastor Jason's sermon from last week or you were here last week, you would remember that in in the message that Pastor Jason shared, Jesus is teaching, um, this is in the passage directly before this in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue of his hometown. He makes some claims about his identity. Now today we understand reading through the whole Bible that Jesus was what they would call the Messiah. He was the saving one that they were looking forward to coming to save them from themselves, to save them from the the ruling power of Rome. And so they were hoping for a military leader. 
Jesus was the son of a carpenter. He was a rabbi. He was not a military leader. But he claimed to be the, the one of God. And their response to that after he preached was to try to throw him off a cliff, to try to murder him. I can say with honesty that if I was, if they attempted to murder me after the Thursday night service, that I would have turned and run and I wouldn't be here this morning because I don't want to be thrown off a cliff. I would have gotten my family in a car and driven as far away as physically possible. But that's not Jesus' response. In the scene directly before, Jesus is almost killed. And then you skip fast forward a few verses later to verse 31 where we are today, and you see that he's preaching again. And now not even just preaching again, but preaching a couple towns over in a bigger synagogue to a bigger crowd. The risk would have been immense, but Jesus' mission and his purpose was worth the risk. The rest of this passage continues to discuss Jesus' authority and how his authority has an impact on our lives and specifically on our chaos as we're in the chaos theory series and we're speaking specifically about chaos and how we respond to that. So we're going to be talking about how Jesus interacts with us within our chaotic moments. So continuing then in verse 33, um, we read that in, in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. He cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So I want to I wanna take a step back, and this is basically talking about a man in the synagogue who's possessed by a demon. And in our American culture, we don't talk about demon possession. We don't, we don't exist in a world where that's commonplace to discuss that or to experience that. Now, maybe if we lived in, let's say, Haiti, for example, or, or a similar country, Demon possession or, or, or evil spirits was something that they've talked about regularly. You might have a healer down the street who, if you were dealing with something like that, you would go to him and you would believe that that, that, that would bring you relief. Or maybe there was someone in your family or yourself that experienced some type of evil spirit or something like that. Now, of course, again, we don't talk about those things in America. That's not part of our everyday life. And so because of that, I'm not going to focus in specifically around the idea of demon possession but more the way in which evil contributes to and most often creates chaos. I also want to point out quickly that Satan is just as real as God. Now, of course, God is significantly more powerful than Satan, but he's real. Demons are real and Satan is real, and they are our enemy. They are our adversary. They Satan would love nothing more than to trip us up and to keep us as far away from God as possible, to keep us as far away from the power of Jesus as possible, because once we are on board with the power of Jesus, now we, through Jesus, have power over Satan, and he's not really about that. So again, we're not so much talking about demon possession, but we are definitely talking about evil. We're definitely talking about sin this morning. We're definitely talking about the way in which our own behavior often contributes to and creates chaos. And as we talk about this, in some ways, comparing ourselves to this man who is possessed by a demon, although not possessed by a demon in ourselves, we definitely have the ability to do evil things. We definitely have the ability to do things that are not right. And so in that, we come to our first point of this morning, which is that our intentions matter. You can see that in this verse, the demon says things that are absolutely true. The demon says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. But you can imagine that this is said with some amount of sarcasm. He says, I, he doesn't just say, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. He also says, aren't you Jesus from Nazareth? And for those who don't know what Nazareth is or, or where that was, it was a very, it was like a small little like podunk type of town that no one really wanted to go to no one was like if you're from nazareth it doesn't bring you notoriety it doesn't bring you respect it almost brings the opposite um it would be like we're in let's just pretend for a moment we're in new york city and someone's like oh yeah i'm from barnegat new jersey and they're like what the heck is that like that doesn't mean anything to me 
So in the same way, this demon kind of is, I get the impression, sort of sarcastically poking fun, like kind of getting a little jab in there, like, yeah, Jesus of Nazareth, big deal, you're from Nazareth, like some small town, your dad's a carpenter, who are you? Like what authority do you have? But in the same way acknowledging Jesus' authority and in the same way saying you're the Holy One of God. So for us, sometimes our intentions are good and sometimes they're bad. And in the same way that this demon-possessed man is saying, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Let's again backtrack to, to last week's sermon and the passage from last week where Jesus makes a similar statement and they try to kill him. So wouldn't it make sense to say that The goal of this demon is to have Jesus killed here on the spot, to have them just throw some stones at Jesus and then it's over, to have them have them throw him off a cliff, find a different cliff and throw him off, put him in the water with bricks around his legs, do whatever you have to do to kill this man, because the demon ultimately understood the authority of Jesus. He ultimately understood the power of Jesus and this demon doing the work of Satan probably in his mind believed that if he could have Jesus killed now, then Jesus wouldn't have years to come of miracles and ministry to prove his authority and his identity to the world. So now, fa- like, kind of bringing it to us. Wh- what is it, how do we compare to a demon? Like, we're not, I mean, I'm bad, I'm not that bad. But, again, sometimes, so, for example, like, sometimes we might do what feels like the right thing, but for the wrong reason. So you ever do something really nice for somebody, you buy someone like a really nice birthday present, or you really go out of your way to sacrifice for someone else, but if you kind of look at the back of your mind, the real reason why you're doing that is because you know your birthday is coming up, (laughs) or because you know that you're about to move, and this guy has a truck, so if I do something nice for him, maybe he'll help me later. You did the right thing, and you made this person smile, you made their day. But at the end of the day, the real reason why you did it was selfish. And the real reason why you did it was for your own gain. It wasn't, it wasn't anything to do with them. It was so that you would benefit doing the right thing for the wrong reason. Or sometimes it's the opposite. You do the wrong thing for what feels like the right reason. You know, we're, we're the new Robin Hood. We're going to steal from the rich and give to the poor. And we justify our action because we're doing it for the right reason. We're, we're getting justice for those poor people, right? But all you really did was steal from somebody. You didn't do anything that was good. You just were able to justify your behavior because of your intention. Because of your negative intention, you were able to justify that evil, sinful thing that you did that now creates chaos. At times, our intentions are completely at odds with God. Unfortunately, it's a sad reality, but but that's where we exist. That's the world that we live in, and that's the people that we so often can be. God being the creator knows what's best for us, but we as the creation like to feel like we have it put together, like we have it figured out. Like, God, you said that, but but I probably know better than you. Like, I could probably figure this out better than you can. On the surface, we put on a really good show, but oftentimes inside we feel some sense of turmoil. We feel some sense of of sadness, or that we feel like there's something missing. And not only do our intentions matter, but our actions matter, don't they? This demon not only had poor intentions, but his actions were rude, disrespectful. It'd be like someone in this room right now, all of a sudden, like, standing up and just saying nice things about me. Like, oh, great, good for you, but you're, you're disruptive. You're, you're creating chaos because things are no longer in order. Jesus is up and teaching and preaching and giving people something to live for, giving people a purpose. Under, helping people understand who God really is, and this demon pops up and interrupts that. He interjects in a way that would make it difficult for people to continue following along. And in the same way, our own actions create chaos so often. And in our sin, what we're really doing is avoiding or ignoring Jesus' authority. Because if Jesus says, I want you to do this, and we do the opposite, we're saying, I know better than you. Your authority means nothing to me. Your power does not, is not meaningful enough in my life to change myself, to change my behavior, to change my thoughts, to change my intentions, to change my actions. Your authority isn't good enough for me. I am too good for you, essentially, is what we're saying. 
Now, in this case, the demon knew Jesus' identity, but he didn't really have respect for Jesus' authority. And again, our own actions can create chaos at times. So the next picture that's going to come up, there it is, is for me personally embarrassing for two reasons. The first is that this disgusting purple room is my laundry room. I did not choose this color. It was like that when we moved in, and we just decided that we would close the door and forget that it was that color because it wasn't worth the trouble to paint it. The other reason, though, that it's embarrassing is because the valve, again, it's kind of blurry, but if you can see the valve that's on the wall, a little pipe that comes out, a little valve, pipe goes back in, that valve is actually the valve that's a shutoff valve for the pipe, which, as you could probably fill in the blank now, is the pipe that froze and destroyed our house. So unfortunately, I didn't know that. It's kind of like situated right above our water heater. So I always just thought, this being my first home, not really knowing much about plumbing or anything like that, I just kind of thought it would had to do with the water heater. Like if I wanted to replace the water heater, I would crank that, and then they would take the water heater out, and I would get a new one, and life would be great. Unfortunately, I was completely wrong. And because I was wrong, now I live in chaos. Because my actions didn't meet up to the level of responsibility I was supposed to have in caring for my home, now my life is in chaos. And because I didn't know, because ignorance is bad. Lack of knowledge is a horrible thing. If you don't know something, you can't act on it. You can't do anything about it. I didn't know that this valve could have saved me from thousands of dollars of damage. I didn't know this valve could have saved me from being displaced from my home with my family for months and months. But at the same time, yeah, ignorance is bad. Not knowing is bad. But it's so much worse. It's so much worse. If I knew what this valve did and I just said, yeah, whatever. How bad could it be? I'll just leave it. We'll figure it out as we go. It's so much worse. Knowledge without action is meaningless. And in the same way, though, if you take it away from the story of my house and my current situation, it's the same in our everyday life. If you don't know that what you're doing is wrong, that's a bad thing because you can't correct it. You don't know it's the wrong thing. But it's so much worse if what, you, if what you're doing, you know it's wrong, but you still make the conscious decision to keep doing it or to go and, and, and seek that out and do it. So again, we're, we're drawing the line of connection between evil and chaos. And as we continue in this story, we'll, we'll see very clearly in this next verse how specifically Jesus responds to evil and in the same way responds to chaos. So this demon rises up, interrupts what Jesus is saying, and it says, but Jesus. Now it doesn't say, so Jesus. It doesn't say that this happened, so Jesus did this. Jesus, Jesus tried to talk to him. Jesus, Jesus tried to tell the man to sit down. It says, but Jesus. So Jesus responds differently than we expect him to. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having doing him no harm. So, so far we've talked about how our intentions matter. We've talked about how our actions matter. And number three, being the most important thing we'll talk about this morning, is that Jesus' authority matters. Jesus himself matters. Jesus is quoted here in this verse saying seven words. Now, we know that he was preaching and teaching earlier. We don't know exactly what about. But he's only quoted saying seven words. And those seven words are all it took for evil to submit to him. His authority was so heavy upon the demon that the demon came out of the man doing him no harm. You might, if you're familiar with, with the Bible and through reading other um, books of the Bible and even Luke itself, you'll see different stories about how a demon-possessed man threw himself off a cliff or a demon-possessed man was cutting and harming himself or a demon-possessed man was aggressive towards other people. In this case, we see that Jesus told the demon to go away and the demon didn't even have time to cause the man harm. The demon had to listen immediately. Evil had to submit to the authority of Jesus immediately. It had no other option but to submit to the authority of Jesus. 
And let's look at how, how the crowd responded to this. So in verse 36, he continues. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. The crowd ultimately responds to Jesus' authority. They're already astonished by his teaching. They're already blown away by what he's saying from the scriptures. And now they see just how much authority his words have. Because they see that he speaks and evil listens. Other people don't have that power. I don't have that power on my own. But Jesus does. Jesus has the authority to speak and demons listen. To speak and demons flee. Out of fear of what he will do to them. These people were amazed and they spread the word. Now, if this was today, if Jesus was here in our church, and if Jesus did the same thing, we as a culture, as a nation, would respond by creating probably about 100 different hashtags, posting on every social media platform Jesus photobomb selfies, because we would be pumped up about this. We would spread the word as quickly as we possibly could. Now, of course, they didn't have Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, and everything else. But they spread the word. They got the word out there because this was important. This had value. This really mattered. Something happened that's different. Something happened that was different than what I expected, but this time in a good way. This guy, Jesus, tells demons what to do and they listen? I've never met anyone like that before. And they're going around like, have you ever met anyone like this before? And everyone's blown away. Word is getting out quickly. Now, as we continue to talk about this word authority, if, it, if you're anything like me, even the word authority makes me uncomfortable. Because none of us, I imagine, like to submit under someone else's authority, whether it's your parents, your teachers, your coaches, whoever it might be in your life, we don't like it. Like if there was a chocolate cake, say like a beautiful, like the size of this table right here on this table instead of all this stuff, and someone came and looked at me and said, you know what, Josh, this cake is beautiful. You are not allowed to touch it. You're not allowed to smell it. You're not allowed to taste it. You can't do anything with it. You have to leave it exactly where it is. What do you think the first thing I do when you turn around and walk out the back door? I'm going to eat as much as I physically can of this cake until I fall over and sick because I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to submit to whatever authority you think you have over me, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to eat the whole thing. <laughs> I'm going to lick the plate clean, even if it makes me sick. Because I don't want to submit to your authority. I don't want to put myself under you. And if you're anything like me, which by all of your laughs, I imagine you are, you don't like to submit to authority either. And even talking about authority is kind of like, why does this guy keep talking about authority? Like, I don't want to mess with that. I don't, like, I'm good. Like, I got my stuff figured out. I don't need anyone else's authority in my life. I got this figured out. And in the same way, that then we figure out, like, we think, I got this. Like, I, I don't need you because I know what's best for me. Like, God, you know, I read the Bible, and I see, like, you tell me all these things I'm supposed to do or not supposed to do, and that's fun. That's great. And that might be good for other people, but, like, I know, I know way better than that. Like, I know how to have a good time. I know how to live my life. I know how to have fun. I know how to do this and that. I don't need to listen to you. We think we know what's best. Now, unfortunately, we're just like Olaf from the movie Frozen. Because Olaf is this snowman, if you've ever seen the movie, who is singing this song about summer. <laughs> and he's craving for summer. He wants it so bad. He wants to lay down on it. Like this picture is a snowman laying on the beach. The irony is insane. He wants to lay on the beach and build sandcastles and do all of these things that he associates with summer. He has such a longing in the depths of his being to experience summer. Like, if I could just experience summer, then I'd finally be happy. I'd finally be satisfied. I'd finally enjoy my life. Winter would finally be over, and I could finally enjoy it. But he doesn't realize that the heat of the summer would melt him. He doesn't realize that the heat of the summer, the thing that he desired most, would actually kill him. In the same way that it's funny, it's really not. Because as we look at Olaf, we're a lot like him, aren't we? If we take it all the way back to the beginning of mankind, we see Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God created everything. It was beautiful. 
He called it good and very good. He created Adam and Eve. And they were living there in the Garden of Eden in perfect peace, in harmony with God himself, enjoying everything that God had given them. And God said, you can do anything you want. You can do absolutely anything. You can go anywhere your eyes can see. You can eat everything your eyes can see. But just don't eat that one thing. Like this, this here is the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, God said, just don't eat that one thing. You can have anything. I'm telling you, literally anything. I've given you more than you could ever ask or dream of. But just don't do that one thing. Now, a serpent slithers up, and we believe this to be either a demon or Satan himself. And the serpent says to them, come on, Adam and Eve. Like, God said that. But how bad could it be? You'll be fine. You know, God is worried that you'll just be too much like him. God is worried that you'll have too much power over him. So that's why he doesn't want you to do it. Just kind of getting in their heads, slithering in, getting in their heads. And they buy in. They say in the same way, how bad could it be? Like, maybe, maybe life will actually be better for us if we do this. So they do. And through their actions, sin enters the world. And with sin comes chaos. I have to imagine that in the Garden of Eden, without sin, if no one ever sinned, we would still be living there, I believe, in that Garden of Eden, in that place of perfect peace and harmony. I have to believe that there wouldn't be hurricanes. There wouldn't be tornadoes. There wouldn't be tsunamis. Because the world in all its order would be perfect. I have to believe that there wouldn't be murder. There wouldn't be assault. There wouldn't be theft. There wouldn't be rape. These things would never exist in this world without sin. In this perfect world. But you and I don't live in that world. You and I live in a very broken world. You and I live in a world where all of those things do exist, where we are face to face with evil every single day. Now, I personally am very grateful for the big idea this morning, which is Jesus himself is the calm in our chaos. Can we just say that together? One, two, three. Jesus is the calm in our chaos. Even just saying those words out loud on this stage this morning, it, it's like a breath of fresh air. It, it fills me with joy. It fills me with peace because I have an understanding that even when life is crazy, it'll be all right. Even in the midst of my own personal chaos in my life, things are going to be all right. And through all of this, there's been a lot of ups and downs. And Jesus didn't take the chaos away. Please understand that. Jesus didn't stop the pipe from freezing. But he has helped my perspective. He has helped my soul to maintain positivity and joy through this experience, as difficult at times as that can be. We understand now, through me saying this four times already, that there's a connection between evil and chaos. And sin in itself is evil. Rebellion against God is evil. When we do things outside of what God calls us to, we're engaging in evil behavior. And it forces me to look at myself. It forces me to look at the areas of my life where, where I have sinned or I am sinning, where I am essentially not submitting to the authority of Jesus, where I am saying, you told me to do that, but I know better than you, so I'm doing something different. Now, if you took a moment to look in the mirror, not to the person to your right or to your left, not to the person at home who decided to skip church this morning, not to that family member, to that coworker, if you looked in the mirror, a long, hard look, what are the things that you would see that you know God would not like? To put this a, a slightly different way, um, some in this room may or may not be familiar with the 12 steps, um, like 12 step groups and things like that. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of that this morning to, uh, for the benefit of time, but step four of that is that we have made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Those words searching and fearless are very powerful. It forces us to honestly look 
on ourselves. Now, this is not for the purpose of beating ourselves up. When we talk about the way that Jesus calms chaos, first he calms our soul. He calms the chaos within our soul by offering us forgiveness of our sins, past, present, and future. There's nothing we can do to earn Jesus' love. There's nothing we can do to stop him from loving us. But we do have to decide, how are we going to respond to his love? How are we going to respond to his sacrifice? In our lives, chaos is created because we choose to do things that we are not supposed to do. Whether it's fudging some numbers on a report at work, whether you get caught or not, you're creating chaos. Whether it's having a little affair on the side, whether you get caught or not, you're creating chaos. Whether it's telling that little white lie, which unfortunately then creates a whole web of lies. Because you almost get caught in that one, and then the next one gets bigger, and then the next one gets bigger, and then the next one gets bigger. And before you know it, you hardly even remember what the truth is, because the chaos has become so thick that you can't see through it. Jesus is the calm in our chaos. He doesn't take the chaos away all the time. But he gives us the peace, the joy, and the strength to get through it. So my challenge for us this morning is to identify an area of your life where Jesus is not the authority. Commit to change in that area. Write it down and invite someone to pray with you. That's a lot of words. So to try to make it a little bit more memorable... Try to think of this as identify, commit, write it, and tell someone. This applies to all of us. None of us are perfect this side of heaven. We all have stuff we need to work on. And this then reminds me of our value of endless growth, which says that there's no limit to the amount of lives that can be reached for Jesus or the impact that he can have on us. Now, of course, this applies to both of those concepts that Jesus can reach an unlimited amount of lives, but specifically this morning we're talking more about that second part, that there's no limit to the impact he can have on us. And in that, as we look at our lives, and as we look at the, these changes we need to make, please remember and please understand, no matter how many times you mess up, God still loves you. God still sent his son to die for you, and if you don't know that, if you don't understand that, please Come talk to me. Please talk to anyone that you see with a volunteer shirt. We want to talk to you about the love of Jesus. We want to talk to you about his love that cannot, that we can't overcome it with our sin. We can't overcome it with our evil. In this story, we see that Jesus has ultimate authority over, over sin. So in my own life, there have been many times that I can look back and see now where I have allowed money itself to become somewhat of a God in my life. That, that there are ways that God tells us to manage our money through the Bible, but I've made decisions that were very different from that, essentially saying, God, you tell me how to manage my money, but I know better than you, so I'm just going to do it my way. And through many meetings with Pastor Jason um, and his encouraging and challenging me to think differently, I've been able to change my perspective about money. And as I changed my perspective, here's something that I realized. Me, ha me trying to have authority over my own money, you, know, you want to know what that really was? That money had authority over me. As our house floods now in 2018, if this happened three years ago, this would have been devastating for me because I wanted to have control over my money and my possessions and my belongings, and it meant so much to me for all of that to be under control and, and just neat and tidy and good. Now, in this situation, I was able to get through it because I understood that it's just a house. I understood that it's just a belonging. It's just, it's just a, belonging? it's just a, a possession. Got my words mixed up. Jesus helped me change my perspective about money, which helped me deal with my current chaos. The sin in my life was that I allowed money to be a God, although it had authority over me. Now giving it over to Jesus, I no longer am worried as I used to be. I no longer fight with my, with my wife about money the way I used to. I no longer am stressed and frustrated about money the way that I used to be. It's my challenge for you this morning that you would identify an area of your life where Jesus is not the authority, where most likely, if you really were honest with yourself, chaos currently exists. 
write it down and invite someone to pray through it with you. I would invite you to, with me, identify that area, commit to change, write it down, and tell someone. In our lives, Jesus is the calm and the chaos.